Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Tania Fernandez Anderson, the District 7 City Councilor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded. It is being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Fios Channel 964. The council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings beginning in April and running through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. You can always do this in several, you can do this in several ways. Attend one of our hearings and give public testimony. We will take public testimony at the end of each departmental hearing and also at a hearing dedicated to public testimony. Um, which has taken place already. Also look forward to June 1st, where we will do public testimony in conjunction with the hearing, uh, specifically focused on capital budget. The full hearing schedule is on our website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. You can give testimony in person here in the chamber and um, virtual, virtually via Zoom. For in-person testimony, please come to the chamber and sign up on the sheet near the entrance for virtual testimony. You can sign up using our online form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation or residence and limit your comments to two to three minutes or uh, whichever time the, ch uh, the chair, myself, um, allows that to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard, email your written testimony to the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. Submit a two minute video of your testimony through the form on our website. For more information on the city council budget process and how to testify, please visit the city council's budget website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Today's hearing is on dockets 0760 to 0762, orders for the FY operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, for the school department, and for the other post-employment benefits, OPEB. Dockets 0763, 0765 to 0766, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations. Dockets 0764, 0767 to 0768, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Our focus area for this hearing will be an overview of the FY budget for the Public Works Department and Boston Transportation Department. Our panelists for today's hearing are Yes, please. Um, I had the uh, wrong sheet. Thank you for being so uh, insightful. Um, Council, uh, Chief Yasha, yes, an introduction would be nice, please, uh, for everyone on the panel. Um, thank, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Chair Fernandez Anderson. Um, so, just to uh, introduce the folks who are uh, up here today, um, we have uh, Mike Burl, uh, who is our Superintendent of Street Operations, uh, Para Jayasing, our City Engineer. Uh, Kate England, our Director of Green Infrastructure, uh, Vineet Gupta, Director of Policy and Planning, uh, Nick Gove, who is our Deputy Chief of Streets for Transportation, also serving as BTD Commissioner, and Omar uh, Koshafa, our uh, newly minted uh, Director of uh, Finance and Budget for uh, the Cabinet, and I am Yasha Franklin Hodge, Chief of Streets. Um, we do have some opening remarks when you're ready, but uh, happy to turn it back to you if there's uh, additional uh, stuff you'd like to. Thank you so much. Um, for our format, this will not be um, a long hearing. Hopefully we can um, narrow this down to just an hour and a half to a couple hours. Uh, we will begin with our uh, opening statements from my council colleagues, just 30 seconds each, and then we'll go straight to your presentation. Um, round one of questions, each will have 10 minutes, and then closing remarks. Um, without further ado, first we have, sorry, I'm joined today um, in this hearing by my council colleagues, Council Liz Braden, District 9, Council Aaron Murphy at large, Council President Flynn, District 2, Councilor at large, Julia Mejia. 
Councillor uh, Braden, you have 30 seconds for opening statements. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> it's good to see you all. Um, uh, I'm going to keep it really brief because I have to leave um, earlier. I can't stay for the whole hearing, so I will. I want to say thank you to BTD and Public Works. Uh, some incredible projects have been moved along quickly in Alston Brighton, uh, the Faneuil Street repaving. Um, was was incredible, uh, saw a lot of coordination and it all went along smoothly and uh, I described it as a, a necklace of potholes that went from Oak Square to Market Street about a mile, so the necklace of potholes is gone, so we're very happy. Um, so I'll have more questions later, but thank you so much. Uh, I also want to thank your departments for being incredibly responsive. Uh, Public Works, um, if we have a, an issue with uh, signage or lights or something that's missing. You've been very, very responsive to um, our calls and thank you for that. Thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you all for being here. Looking forward to this budget hearing and just hearing your priorities and making sure that we've allocated enough money to keep our streets safe and, you know, our people moving through most of the calls we get into, um, at least my office, either are on ISD side for rats or it's traffic issues. Um, but people need to get to work, drop their kids off at school. They want to make sure they feel safe walking our streets and know that all of you are invested in that. And just want to shout out all of these departments here. Very um, responsive. I'll echo what Councillor Braden said. Um, lots of different... Um, people that we call in all of your departments and they pick right up and help make sure that we're getting constituents what they need, constituent services um, issues fixed and just thank you for that. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor <laughs> President Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair. and Thank you for your important work and leadership, um, Council fernandez Anderson. I also want to thank the panel that's here for the work they're doing in the city, for your leadership. But I also want to acknowledge all the men and women up in the, um, up in the seating up there as well. I have the opportunity to work with them almost weekly and, or daily, and they do a tremendous job for the residents of Boston, and especially the, the workers that are out in the streets on Saturdays and Sundays and the weeknights and late at night and away from their families, public works and, and transportation are always there doing the best job they can for the residents of Boston under very difficult circumstances as well. So they're really the backbone of our city, these city workers. I don't think they get paid enough um, and, and they're, they're not often treated, treated well by the public at times, um, especially traffic enforcement people. Um, but we know the important work they play because they love this city, they love the neighborhoods and public works and transportation department. It's quality of life issues, it's neighborhood services, it's nuts and bolts of city government, and that's what, that's what an urban area is all about, that's what a city is all about, providing the best services we can to the residents of Boston. And, and the public works people and the transportation people are doing it exceptionally well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to you, um, Chiefs and Department Heads and Commissioners and all of those big titles you all have here, um, and to the people who are always behind the scenes uh, making the work happen. We really do appreciate you all. Um, I am going to really lean in on the Fair Chance Act that we passed last year in regards to, in the Public Works Department in particular, in terms of nepotism and favoritism and people being able to move up the ladder. So I'm always going to look at issues around racial equity in your processes in terms of promotional opportunities for black and brown people in particular. And then the other piece that I'm going to lean into is just really about decision-making models for um, like the road diet and other issues that have bubbled up across the city of Boston. Um, I think that oftentimes decisions, you know, the way things get done here in the city of Boston, it's always a growing opportunity for us to figure out how we can 
meet the moment. So looking forward to what that looks like. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Um, we do have a budget breakdown from our budget analyst uh, that I think if my council colleagues wants me to present, we have it ready. You would like that, okay. We have it ready to go um, up as a, it's a PowerPoint and um, there are some things that I would like to focus on in terms of like how capital is decided and what's the priority or how do you get to a priority. Um, how do you say, for example, that Charlestown will get um, the most capital this in, in, in this fiscal year than everybody else, um, and or every other neighborhood? And I and I know that there are reasons, there are practical reasons where you get to that, right? Like, and you're the experts. You, if you make recommendations, I want to have conversations about um, how to. Uh, understand at least for the public so that they can understand and make it transparent because I feel like communities that are of lower socioeconomic class advocate less um, while uh, communities that advocate more gets more in the capital but in this case it's more like wait this is streets right like if it's needed let's go to that first and what's priority it's more engineering if anything so um, really want to have that trans transparent conversation with you and obviously um, thank you for all of the work that you do. I also want to echo my counselor, um, President Flynn, who mentioned um, your uh, work and how responsive you are. Um, I, I've said this before, but you are definitely one of the cabinets that responds the fastest um, um, expediently, and I really appreciate that. One of my biggest priorities for District 7 is cleanliness, beautification, um, and safe streets. So um, I appreciate all of those three, I think, fall in your department. So appreciate um, you for that. But when I, when we do get into hard conversations about capital and prioritizing um, communities of lower socioeconomic class, then know that it's obviously not personal that you are doing everything that you can as professionals. Um, but um, it is my job to have that conversation with you. All right. Uh, so without further ado. Um, before I bore you to death. Um, I'd like to hear your presentation and um, then we'll go into um, ours. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair, again for, um, uh, for the opportunity um, and thank you, Councillors. Uh, I just want to start, I, I've already uh, mentioned all the folks who are up here at the table, but uh, I want to uh, acknowledge one other member of our senior leadership team, uh, Julia Campbell, who uh, recently joined us as our Deputy Chief of Streets for Infrastructure and Design. Um, she is not here today in person because she's finalizing her relocation from uh, the West Coast to Boston, um, and uh, she is, however, watching uh, the stream. Um, and we'll be here next year for our, our budget hearing. Um, well, she'll be here next well, week. Since, you're, since we're doing that, Chief, thank you so much. Julia, welcome aboard. Um, I wanted to acknowledge my uh, council colleague who just joined us, um, <laughs> Council Coletta, as well. Um, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, as was noted, there are uh, other team members uh, from the Public Works leadership team uh, here uh, in the gallery. Uh, uh, Mike Donaghy, Danny Nee, Chris Coakley, uh, uh, Dennis Roach, Jerry Gorman, uh, Tom McKay, uh, Clarence Perkins, uh, Trish Casey, uh, Norman Parks, uh, all have joined us for, um, for this as well. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, I want to uh, uh, echo uh, Councilor Flynn, Council President Flynn's comments about the people who do the work in our departments because you know, we can sit here as a leadership team and talk about our goals and our vision, and we can talk about the budget and the new initiatives, but none of this work happens without the people who do the work every day uh, in this building, on the streets, in our district yards. Uh, this is how our cabinet functions. Um, you know, we have uh, approximately 800 people within the, 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 the cabinet, and um, they do jobs that range from issuing permits to designing streets to uh, fixing street lights to hanging signs to, uh, you know, you name it, any of the, the functions, you know, making sure that our streets are clean uh, and well cared for. Um, you know, repairing our brick sidewalks, all of these are things that, uh, that, that we cannot do without the workforce that we have and, uh, and they are the backbone of this cabinet and I'm just very grateful for their public service. Um, so we're not going to do like a big presentation about everything that goes on in the cabinet. Um, we have a few slides, um, but they are really just focused on uh, some of the new initiatives that are uh, funded in uh, this budget, three specifically. 
Uh, but before we get to the slides, I just want to give a, a quick big picture of what we see as our primary goals and priorities as a cabinet. Um, just to frame how we think about how we allocate our time and, and the financial resources we have. So the first and, you know, frankly most important is the sort of core services that the city relies on every day. You know, we spend a lot of time in places like this talking about transformation and new initiatives, but the core services, whether it's filling potholes, picking up trash, uh, fixing the, the lighting infrastructure, the signals, um, you know, uh, plowing, uh, sweeping streets, uh, issuing parking tickets, uh, you know, maintaining our bridges, uh, maintaining our roads and our sidewalks, uh, these, this, is the, this is the foundation, right? This is the foundation uh, of the city. It's the foundation of our work. Uh, and it is what this kind of work to provide for the everyday needs of the people of Boston is, is the most important job that we have. Um, so we are very proud of what we are able to do. We have an incredible team of dedicated people who do this. But we also know that we always need to invest and improve in how we deliver those core services. And so that remains a big focus for our leadership team. The second big theme that we have as a cabinet is safety. People of all ages and abilities deserve the right to move freely and without fear in the city. And yet we are a city where every year more than 3,000 times the EMS, the fire department, the Boston Police Department responds to an injury crash on our streets. Um, just in the last few days, on Friday morning, a three-year-old in South Boston was grazed by a van, and it was only not worse because her mother pulled her back at the last second. Um, on Monday, as we were preparing for a press conference on street safety, we got word that an elder in Brighton had been struck crossing Washington Street and was, um, uh, you know, received serious injuries. Um, Yesterday, two kids, a brother and sister, were crossing Dorchester Ave and Fields Corner in front of the Fields Corner MBTA station and were struck. All of these people have survived. They are all, you know, they've been treated thanks to our incredible first responders in our hospital system, and they will be physically okay. But these kinds of crashes, these experiences, they leave scars on our community, not just in the body, but in the trauma that people experience both those who are directly involved and for all of those who travel around the city knowing this risk, worrying about their kids or their parents as they move. This is essential work for us to uh, help bring these crashes, to eliminate serious injury crashes and fatalities in the city of Boston uh, and to make the changes we need to make in our street system so that people can move safely. And we'll talk about some of what we're doing in this regard in, uh, when we talk about new initiatives. Um, the third big area that we are focused on is shifting how we move. Um, it's four o'clock now, and if you were to walk out of this building and walk a couple blocks uh, you know, towards uh, the, the surface road, you will see immediately that how we get around Boston has to change. Uh, you know, Tuesday through Thursday, almost every week, the regional highway system reaches its capacity at some point in the afternoon. And all of that traffic, all of that delay, backs up and spills onto all of our city streets. Because we all know we're on the list of one of the worst traffic cities in the country. Um, and that has cost in time, in quality of life, in delay, uh, in missed family moments. Um, this is, however, despite our traffic, a vibrant economy with tremendous amount of growth potential. And in the years and decades ahead, we'll add tens of thousands of new residents and hundreds of thousands of new jobs in Boston. And so imagine if every one of those residents and every one of those workers added yet another car to our already congested streets. The only way we can keep moving as a city is to change how we move. And so we in the streets cabinet are working to change our streets to make that possible. We need transit that's reliable, convenient, and affordable. Part of that work is supporting the MBTA and their much needed effort to turn around a system that is struggling to move people uh, where they need to go. The mayor is right now with the general manager of the MBTA and the secretary of transportation in her office talking about what the city can do to support uh, that transformation. Walking, the most basic form of transportation there is, needs to be safe, comfortable, and accessible for all. And cycling as a form of transportation that, that many people, will, some people will choose, 
Uh, we need to, in order to encourage people to do that, we need a connected citywide network of low stress uh, routes for cycling. And I can tell you all about the environmental benefits of fewer car trips and the health benefits and the safety benefits, and all of these are real and significant. But whether you agree with those points or not, I think we can all agree that traffic and all the quality of life costs that come with it will only get worse if we don't change course, if we don't find ways to do more of our trips without cars. We cannot build more roads, we cannot build more street parking in the city. And so when we add people, when we add trips, we need to find ways to shift some of those out of uh, single occupancy vehicles. Um, <clears throat> You know, despite, uh, despite what you may read in the comments section, uh, I don't think everyone should run out and sell their car and buy a bike. Um, but I do think we need to reshape our city so that people have more freedom to choose how they move and so that there are good alternatives to driving uh, for more of the trips that people take. So in all three of these areas, core services, safety, and mode shift, we've made a lot of progress in the last year and we're happy to share some of that with you, but there are challenges. Hiring remains exceptionally difficult. We have significant areas of our cabinet that are uh, understaffed. This is most acute within our operations team and our engineering teams. Um, we have work to do on our own internal processes. We have restructured our leadership team in the last year and added, some, uh, added and promoted some uh, great people within that team. Uh, but there's more work to do uh, to make sure that we're set up for success. Uh, but I am optimistic. Uh, Mayor Wu's FY24 budget proposal provides the financial foundation that we need for continued progress and to deliver on these key goals. So I'm going to talk just quickly about three of the big uh, new initiatives that uh, are proposed in this budget. Uh, first, I want to talk about the city safety surge. This was announced on Monday. Um, there are eight new positions and almost 12 million in new capital investment in addition to the capital that is uh, already allocated through existing programs and projects. Uh, the goal of this, uh, there are three big uh, uh, outcomes we hope to achieve from this. One is to provide more traffic calming, particularly in the form of speed humps in more places in the city. It should not be a competition between neighbors and neighborhoods for who gets safer streets. We know we need to bring safer streets to all parts of Boston, and so we are working to speed up the pace at which we can do that. Uh, we are also working to redesign intersections. This is where most of our crashes happen. So our goal is to redesign 25 to 30 intersections a year to bring a variety of safety features into place that can help uh, reduce the risk of crash and, and make it safer for safer places, especially for people walking and biking, but also for drivers. Uh, the third part of the safety surge is focused on signals. Uh, we want a signal policy and an implementation of our signal policy that makes it safer for people walking uh, and provides a baseline level of assurance that if you are crossing that you will not, uh, that we have, we have set up the intersection so that you are not being placed at any undue risk. Uh, we've recently revised our signal operations guidelines, rewritten, I should say, our signal operations guidelines from top to bottom to uh, bring this baseline pedestrian safety uh, into the way that, this, uh, that our signaling system functions. Uh, the second area of investment uh, that I want to highlight is green infrastructure. Uh, we have two new positions and uh, roughly uh, $500,000 for uh, maintenance. Uh, and $750,000 for uh, site assessment. Uh, green infrastructure is a way to introduce natural elements into our built environment. These have multiple benefits. It helps us filter and manage stormwater. It can provide additional greenery in our neighborhoods and reduce heat island effects. It can add tree cover and shade. Uh, it can beautify our neighborhoods. And too often when we build infrastructure, all you see is hard surfaces, pavement, stamped brick, concrete, uh, because we've not had the capacity to maintain planted surfaces and we've not had the right policies and expertise within our team to be able to build those. So with this investment, we will be able to do more green infrastructure in Boston. This site assessment will not only help us understand the condition of our existing green infrastructure, but will identify areas of opportunity for both existing built spaces and future projects. One of those future projects is the Cummins Highway reconstruction. Uh, this is from Wood Ave um, almost all the way to Mattapan Square. Uh, and uh, this is a substantial capital project, but this budget adds an additional 2.5 million to ensure we can add green infrastructure features along that corridor. 
Uh, the last <laughs> investment area that I want to mention is uh, the work we're doing around electrification uh, of the transportation system we have and electric vehicles in particular. Um, we are adding one new position for a program manager to focus on our work to ensure that everyone in the city has access to charging infrastructure. Uh, we have a uh, number of uh, existing city-operated charging uh, facilities in our municipal lots. Those are being expanded and we'll be introducing um, what's called DC fast chargers uh, in many of those lots that will allow us to, that can allow you to charge a car in as little as 20 minutes instead of having to leave it for many hours. Uh, we're also working to do a, a series of demonstration projects on curbside charging. So thinking about a future where may, the many people who charge, uh, who don't have off-street parking, uh, will still have a way to charge a vehicle when parked on city streets. Uh, we are investing city money into this, but we are also working to uh, tap into the uh, substantial amount of federal funding that's available to support uh, charging programs. Uh, and so we have grant applications in the works for uh, a number of uh, federal and state uh, grant programs. Uh, we are also, you know, for us, electric vehicles are not just cars. Uh, so we are adding funds to support the addition of electric bikes into the blue bike system. Uh, and we are funding a uh, reduction in the cost associated with Blue Bikes passes, both to reduce the first year cost for new members, um, you know, for the general public, and to bring the price for our income eligible members down to $5 a year, um, really making this a, a universally accessible option for anyone. So I will stop there. Those are just three of the initiatives. They're sort of not far from all that we are doing, but uh, they hopefully gives you a sense of some of the new things that, that, this, that we uh, in our cabinet and this administration is excited about. Uh, again, I'm very grateful to the council for the opportunity uh, and for your consideration of this budget proposal and for the support uh, that you've offered uh, to us in the work that we do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think I need to borrow that clicker from you. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate you. Okay. Um, I'll go over this presentation again for those of you who uh, are at home. Uh, last um, budget season, I filed an amendment uh, to create a budget analysis in order for us to do uh, at least to sort of gear up or start up uh, with our participatory budget efforts um, and her name is Karishma. She is amazing and this is uh, one of the presentations that she does for every single uh, budget hearing. Um, so for Public Works Department um, Boston and Boston Transportation Department, um, the, the, here's some background and definitions. Uh, please email me or uh, the uh, Committee Ways and Means uh, email and I'm happy to submit a copy to you. Um, these are, this is the org chart for Public Works Department operating budget. And FY24 recommended versus FY23 um, spending. And uh, just a few notes there that um, we have. So um, in terms of um, how to read this, blue bold are those categories that are spent. Uh, less than 50% of their FY23 appropriation to April 18, 2023. Red bold are those categories that are, have spent more than 100% of their FY23 appropriation to April 18, 2023. And so here, um, FY24, uh, Boston, um, uh, sorry, Public Works Department, FY24 recommended versus um, FY23 spending personnel. And um, I will not go through like every comparison or the details here because it would be forever. Um, I think this is like a hundred page presentation. Um, but um, here in an outline form, you could see it here in the chart um, by uh, description, department employees, emerging employee, emergency employees, workers' compensations, unemployment compensation, and overtime. The next slide um, recommended uh, versus 20, FY24 versus FY23 spending contractual um, and the blue recommended 24, the red FY24 recommended and the green would be total spend and encumbered. Um, and mostly again contractual, so 
utilities, contractor services, repairs, telecommunications repairs, maintenance, and transportation, and waste removal. And again, um, in an outline form. And then when you go into um, current charges and obligations, um, legal liability, workers' comp, medical, and current charges. Um, and this is a uh, the recommended versus spending um, for supplies and materials. And then for equipment and other. Uh, this is the FY24 by program and expense type and historical spending. And um, our pie chart shows you that um, for Boston um, Public Works Department, FY24 recommended by program, building facility, um, uh, I'll start with the biggest one, waste reduction, 58.1%. Um, then to second highest is highway um, field operations to 19%, and then third, street lights, and so on. And again, happy to um, send this to you via records. For the FY24 um, Boston Public Works, recommended by expense um, here, and then spending and overtime program and in comparison to the different um, fiscal year going back to FY21. Um, and here, uh, BWD change, PWD change by program, or funds by program. Spending, um, am I in the right one? Spending by expense type over time. And then it goes into programmatic breakdown. And so um, I'm going to stop there because, again, um, there are, you, you do so much, and it's a cabinet with a whole bunch of departments. And I actually wanted to get to the capital um, part of this because I know folks will be interested. Highway field operations. Operations change um, by expense type. Highway field operations change by expense type again. Street lights. And construction management. Sorry, my glasses don't really work. Okay, I've caught up. Um, building facility. I'm, I'm gonna get to it soon. Mm. Engineering, Karishma, any any help? Where's the? Um... Huh? No, it's here. I saw it. Somewhere. Yeah. Um, all right. While I while I look for that, um, I think I'll go to um, my my council colleagues for questions. Um, I really wanted to um, ask my questions first because. Um, I think they would have been brief, but it's not proving to be brief, so I'll stop there. Um, I will look forward to the capital budget, and while you, you guys ask your questions, and then I'll come back to me. Okay. Um, so, Council Mejia, if it's okay with you, I'll stop the presentation there, because it's just so long. <clears throat> Thank you. No problem. Um, Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Let's see. Um, EV charging stations, I know we're waiting for federal grants. I think we've got about eight in Austin Brighton. I believe we have a few more than that, but I don't know the exact counts. Because we've, we've got three installing. municipal lots, and I don't see 
Where are they? <laughs> uh, we can get you the map um, that they're dispersed throughout the city uh, where we have, uh, not in every municipal lots, but in many of our lots. So we have the map online and be happy to send you the list of those locations. Uh, I know the other issue in, in, in the Brighton Centre is that we have two municipal lots. One of them is adjacent to District 14, the police station, mm -hmm. and a large part of it is taken up with police vehicles. I know uh, this is more of a uh, occupation is nine-tenths of the law, they say. <laughs> Um, it's just in terms of the business district, I don't know if, if you folks could have a conversation with BTD and see if we could free up some more uh, parking in that municipal lot for uh, patrons of our local businesses. Um, it's, you know, I appreciate, it just seems that they have a lot of equipment that maybe just, just park there because it's convenient rather than necessary, uh, but just a question. I've asked it and didn't get a good answer. I didn't get any answer, so I'll, I'll throw it to you, folks. Um, the um, Commonwealth Ave project, the, the 11 million. I, I just, you know, we're, uh, we're doing Commonwealth Ave in phases. I don't know. Do we have an estimated time when that might start? And I know we have to work with uh, the MBTA on that, and goodness knows who else. Uh, and I know it's a big project, it's complex, because we're talking about moving the tracks, I understand. So I'd like an update on, on an estimated time of when that might be starting, this particular phase that we're doing. Thank you, Thomas. Can you hear me? Oh, very good. Council, as you noted, there are two phases. There's the phase three, four, which is the remaining part of ComEd and then there's the intersection of Harvard and Comet. The, the phase three and four, right now we are sort of in a limbo situation because the MBTA has decided at the most interesting time to move the tracks from where they are to the center. And that's a very uh, challenging exercise on their part. We, have, we are working very closely with them, but we are somewhat uh, slowed because we have to sort of stay in synchronization with their project. But we are in coordination, and things are going a little bit slowly, but hopefully in the right direction, because they understand that whenever they finish their project, they have to incorporate the work which we are doing. So the good thing is it will be a combined project, but it's going a little bit slower than what we were used to. Yeah, very good. Um, so any chance of any idea when that might, when we might do it? Like hopefully, sorry, councillor, hopefully sooner than later, but I wish I had a better answer for you. But since it is another state agency that is not within yeah. our immediate control, it would not be very uh, prudent of me to set a schedule that might be uh, adjusted. Yeah. In the, future. Um, the other question I had was in relation to the speed bumps. Do we have uh, uh, any identified locations? Like I could name a few off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. I, do we have a... a, a do we have uh, targeted spaces for speed bumps across in, in Austin Brighton? Uh, we do, uh, and so we have a map uh, that we've posted on the city's website under the safety surge page. Um, if you navigate to safety surge and click speed humps, uh, you will see a map of the zones that we have prioritized. There are some zones in the city currently uh, under design or construction, and then there's a series of zones marked in blue that show what we are intending to do over the next three years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you'll be able to see which of those zones uh, there are, are in your district. Um, we have prioritized the zones in the city. We, in order to ensure that we are um, that we are building speed humps and calming infrastructure in every part of the city. We are committed to doing uh, at least one zone per year in each council district. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so you will see that sort of, you know, that, that, that distribution around the city. Um, but within the districts, we prioritize based on a series of risk factors uh, of uh, both safety history and the presence of more vulnerable populations to determine which zones happen first. So we can share that with you and send you the link mm -hmm. for that. And then the other, um, you talk about problematic intersections. Um, I know uh, your folks are working on uh, Cleveland Circle. Mm -hmm. um, we, yeah, I think you've had two incredibly um, dedicated young um, co-ops are doing a work on a project, doing a fabulous job, by the way. Um, 
So I, I don't know. I, I, again, it's an it's an intersection that has tracks going through it, and MBTA trolley, um, streetcars, trolleys, whatever you call them, right here. Um, you know, when it's a really pedestrian nightmare and it's a driver's nightmare. When when can we might expect an improvement in that? I think it it must be one of the worst intersections in the city. Yeah. No, uh, th thank you, Councillor. And as you point out, uh, two of our co-ops have been focused on that intersection and have worked with local abutters as well as local community members to try and make it safe. The design approach that we have. Uh, we've adopted is a quick build approach, so we're not going to reconstruct the whole intersection. That would take, you know, tens of millions of dollars. And so, construction will probably happen next year. That's what I can say at this point. Uh, it's not necessarily in our timeline to do this year. We'd like to do it this year, but uh, that's that's our current thinking. Yeah. Um Sooner rather than later would be yeah, great. Uh, there's a there's a, net, a senior living um, facility in that space around, and when we talk about when your staff talk about oh it might be years and they go like hang on a minute we don't have years you better get a move yeah. on. No, so these older folks would really like to see these because they really are trapped in their building they can't safely cross right. the road right. over there it's really bad. If, if if there are some specific improvements we can do this year to address that particular situation we can definitely explore that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And I'm keeping going here while I've... Uh, mattress recycling, um, Alston Brighton, um, Alston Christmas, hundreds if not thousands of mattresses. How, how is that mattress recycling going? That's one for you. <laughs> so um, it's been challenging out of the gate. Uh, it, was, it was obviously, as we, I think we've kind of heard that it was, it was a edict set forth by the uh, Mass DEP. <coughs> We were left to kind of figure out a plan in year one, and we have. We figured a good plan from um, Dennis Roach and Jerry Gorman did some really good work with, actually, in a former life of um, Omar working um, on some um, MBE contracts. Um, we, we were able to get two contractors out. Um, to your point about Alston Christmas, um, smartly by Dennis and Jerry's standards, they've created a surge time. So we asked them to pick up 70 a day, normal season as we get to that for the, for the four weeks around both, because we're starting to count March 31st as a move-in out day. I think we're, we're, we're a bit wishful on that, the people that kind of spreading it out between Labor Day weekend and Memorial Day weekend with that, with that college move out. But we have a surge season where we've got uh, both those contractors add trucks on the street. They add volume to the contract, so they're able to pick up more. Um, we're living it right now with this March 31st window of this two weeks before, two weeks after. Um, we're seeing some good work done. Um, but again, we are learning from this mm. first year. So learning it's, uh, as you go. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's, it feels like in some neighborhoods they fall from the sky. Um, and, you know, maybe they border neighborhoods or cities that don't have a plan, and maybe they get mobile and come into the city. So we've got to, you know, we're, we're always mindful of moving trash and moving debris. Um, but um, we do have a plan. We do have contracts that they're working, working very hard. Um, and again, they've, they've, they've built in that surge time. So we'll have time in between those two. Yeah, thank you. And what's your best advice? Call that three one one, like a, always. A, always schedule and and schedule it and have it. And if you're moving out in a week's time, give them call them a week ahead yeah, of time. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's very smart. We 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 had some delays. Well, not delays. We had some back up. There was up to two weeks in some neighborhoods. We also had next day in other neighborhoods. So yeah. I think that we're down around four to five days now in some of our heavier districts. Um, so I'd say you give it a week, we should be good. Around the surge time, give it a couple of weeks. My wife called in one for Tuesday. We're getting it picked up on Friday. So we're inside of the Very quarters. good. Thank you. I see Madam Chair is waving the clock at me. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Council Braden. Um, OK, we have the right presentation up. We'll get to that. Um, and I'll try to be as quick as possible. And for those of you at home, please forgive me if I'm rushing through. So for Public Works Department and Boston Transportation um, Department, the streets ARPA projects um, funding are listed um, here on the slide, um, t 10 million to free fare. Councillor, uh, we're not able to see on the screens on the oh. side here, so. You're not able to see. No, there. There, okay. there we go, uh, it just came back. 
Can you see it? Yep, now we can. And so if I'm not familiar with like the full name because here it gets chopped off, um, feel free to help me out. Um, and so fare free, 10 million, 8 million for America's... Best biking city. Best biking city. Um, and you came up with these names? <laughs> <laughs> Team effort. All right. And 8 million to walkable city. Um, 2.5 million uh, municipal. What's the rest uh, of that? I think this is food waste processing. Okay. Um, and 2 million to traffic calm. And 500,000 to center for... Hard to recycle materials. Thank this you. That's a good quiz. 275,000 to Mission Hill. Link. Link. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I, 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 I voted for that. I, that, was, that was one of uh, the moves I partnered with the Council of Bach on last year. Um, street, so, streets ARPA funding here outlined. And then um, B, uh, PWD capital projects. And you see here from by neighborhoods. So, Charlestown, um, and this is in the millions. Um, Charlestown uh, for total projects, sorry. Um, the blue representing authorization FY24, and the red total authorization. Um, and then you can see it here by neighborhood. So beginning with Charlestown at 407 uh, million, East Boston 16 million, uh, multiple neighborhoods, and I wanna understand that a little bit more, um, at 70 million, South Boston 59 million, South End 11 million, Citywide, 168 million, downtown government center, 8 million, Chinatown, 1 million, Harbor Islands, 111 million, Rosendale, 7 million, Roxbury, 10 million, Back Bay, 30 million, Alston, Brighton, 15 million, Kenmore, uh, Fenway, Kenmore, 2 million, Mattapan, 28 million, um, and Dorchester, zero dollars um, and then when you when we go to um, the capital by neighborhood um, per person spending um, this is what you get so um, this is just a breakdown to sort of give people an idea of population there and how things are used but it doesn't really reflect to the priority of the projects of course so um, and we'll talk further about that um, this is the breakdown uh, by neighborhood for, by count. Um, so projects per neighborhood um, from Charlestown all the way to um, Dorchester again. Um, so, okay. That's citywide. So five in Charlestown, two in East Boston, uh, then multiple neighborhoods of seven. Um, South Boston, four, South End, four. Citywide, 15. Isn't multiple neighborhood also citywide? Not familiar with this analysis. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. How we get the raw data um, may not be how you have it. Uh, so downtown government center, three projects. That Chinatown, one. Harbor Islands, two. Rosendale, three. Roxbury, four. Back Bay, th two. Um, Austin Brighton, three. Fenway, um, Kenmore, one. Mattapan, two. And Dorchester, one. Um, I have some questions about if, for example, um, Back Bay is only two, then why double the cost and understanding what those projects are as well. Um, BPD capital by project type. Um, and then for non-school building, new infrastructure, uh, 340 million streets, 392 million infrastructure um, improvements general, uh, project and then 181 million program, 30 million IT, 1 million. I definitely think that, um, not that I want to speak through this like a voiceover, but um, I definitely think that did, IT should get way more. There's like, so much we could be doing with that, right? Um, and then streets overview here. Um, and I'll stop there. Um, as I mentioned to those at home, if you'd like a copy, happy to share with you um, and happy to coordinate with any community organization that would like for me to uh, facilitate one of my um, budget workshops for community. 
All right, um, I'll stop there and continue on. Councillor Murphy, you're next. Thank you, you have the floor. You're welcome. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation. Some of follow up from Councillor Braden's questions. Um, when you hear that speed bumps are coming, and as an at large councillor, everyone's calling, seeing if it's their street, if it's their neighborhood. And I know you touched on the couple zones, but if you could explain a little bit more about that. And also, when bike lanes go in, get a lot of calls about off street parking loss. And there probably is, I know, a dashboard. So when we get the calls, and we get a lot of them, um, is there a way, because I know we've talked about this before, um, Yasha, about kind of that fact check, because there's concerns about a lot of changes or policies that might go into place, but what are the actual facts to match it? So do you have like a dashboard about different projects going on? In the last week, we've gotten a lot of emails and calls about like the JP bike lanes and trying to like figure out like, oh, where are we on that? Something must have come out because I know people are asking about it. Got a lot of calls about, hey, is, you know, are the speed bumps coming to my street? And I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't know, let me find out. So is there a way that we're sharing that, not just with us on the council, but to the public where it's kind of out there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, so on the first point about speed humps, uh, so yes, um, we have, there are two maps uh, now on the city website uh, on the safety search page. One shows which streets are eligible for speed humps. Uh, and so it, it sort of, we have a set of criteria, technical criteria about eligibility. Um, you know, primarily the intent is to install them in, on residential streets, not on arterials, not on MBTA bus routes, not on routes used by our, as primary routes by emergency services. Um, so uh, that map is, is public. There's also a map that shows the zones that we will be building uh, over the next four years. And so those are um, uh, both available. Um, we are, we'll, sort of, you know, some of the feedback we've seen is it's it's not, the question you just asked, when will my street get speed humps? Mm -hmm. It can be a little hard to answer that. Um, you know, the, the map that shows the zones doesn't have every street name on it. And so um, we're uh, working to make sure that we have the right maps up. But our intent here is to give people that, that look in advance. Um, it is important to state that we are working in zones, and we are working in zones for a reason, which is that when we have historically installed speed humps along a single street in response to um, concerns from neighbors, uh, what frequently happens is that simply pushes the unwanted driving behavior onto neighborhood streets. Mm -hmm. And so our approach has been to, to take a, a grid of streets and, and do traffic calming on them all at once. Um, in terms of bike lanes, I appreciate the you know, sort of interest in having factual conversations um, with folks about uh, projects. Um, I'll, I'll first say that you know, with any bike project that we do, our you know one of the primary goals in the design is to how to minimize impacts on. Uh, other users of the street, and in particular, minimizing parking impacts. So um, when we design a lane, we often go through multiple options and iterations. Which side of the street is it on? Uh, what type of materials and, and width do we use? And um, you know, we are always evaluating in the different uh, create with the different options, sort of which what the what the impacts are, and, and trying to find ways to achieve our safety goals for people who cycle without. Uh, creating any undue or unnecessary impacts on people who drive. But as noted, there are sometimes projects in which we do end up needing to remove parking, uh, some amount of parking, uh, as part of a, a, a bike lane project. Um, every bike project that we have has its own dedicated web page. If you go to boston.gov slash bike dash lanes, you'll be able to see all of the projects we have in design in the city, each project has its own page, depending upon where it is in the planning process. Some of them have very detailed information about actual concept designs, uh, parking impacts. Some are still earlier in the planning phase, so we're more in the stage of soliciting input from community members and haven't yet published actual designs. Um, I, you know, I think you're likely hearing uh, about Boylston Street in Jamaica Plain. Um, you know, this is a street where uh, we are, uh, it's, a, it's a critical uh, east-west connection that 
uh, eventually will uh, allow people to connect all the way from uh, the emerald necklace sort of in at the Brookline border, uh, down South Huntington, down Boylston to the Southwest Corridor and continuing up into Eggleston uh, and eventually all the way to Franklin Park. So this is a sort of uh, a, a critical link in a very long piece of the bike network. Uh, but because of the width of the street and the curvature of the street on a portion of it, we may need to eliminate uh, parking uh, between uh, on, a, on a segment of that street. And so I think you know, we're in conversation with community members. I actually think tonight at 5.30 there is a walk uh, in the neighborhood with, um, you know, to, with people to, to kind of talk through what we're planning and to get questions answered. But we have a team of folks that do this work. They're always happy to meet with constituents. They get a lot of email. They respond to a lot of email. And they would also be happy to meet with you and your team to uh, help make sure you have the information you need. Thank you. You mentioned about the speed bumps, knowing that it could cause other effects in the neighborhood. So do you have like street changing one ways? Like what other things do you think about when you're putting in speed bumps? Yeah, so for the speed hump program that we've launched, we are confining it to speed humps. And um, this came out of, you know, the, the, the city has had for a number of years a neighborhood slow streets program where we've taken um, sections of a neighborhood through a process where uh, neighbors nominate their uh, network of streets. Um, we have an evaluation process and then we select, you know, we've selected every year a handful of neighborhoods to do a very intensive redesign of the street network, speed humps, curb line changes, sometimes directional changes or other restrictions. Um, where we have delivered those projects, they have been very well liked and very effective. The problem that we have found is that we are not delivering enough of them. And we have not been able to, the, the intensity of time to do community engagement, to do design and to do construction of projects that move curb lines and change the geometry or the directionality of streets is really extensive. So we, it, with this new program in the safety surge, we've kind of broken apart the different types of safety interventions we can take. Speed humps, because they are, relatively speaking, they're constructed, but they are the simplest kind of construction you can do. They're mounds of asphalt with uh, some paint and some signs. They do not affect drainage. They do not uh, you know, impact uh, any other. They do not affect parking. So we are implementing these speed hump zones um, and only implementing speed humps as part of that section of the program so that we can move quickly, we can have separate construction contracts, separate design contracts, and really work through these zones as quickly as we possibly can. Um, we are doing the intersection work, and we do have the ability where there are specific broader neighborhood concerns to look at directional changes um, and other types of more intensive um, uh, uh, modifications. But we have found that. Um, any, you know, any change in direction of a street uh, has winners and it has losers, or these people who uh, feel like, oh, well, now I have to go that extra block around to get to where I live. And so it does require a lot of community conversation. Uh, and we can't, if we, if we tie that to the speed hump program, we will not be able to build the speed humps at the pace we want to do it. Thank you. Um, can I just one follow up and then I'll be done? Thank you. Um, I hear a lot about the speeding, but how it's tied into also enforcement in a lot of the community meetings. So are you working with the Boston police about tickets? Because a lot of people say, well, why aren't we just ticketing people if they're speeding down the streets? Yeah. Uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of the Boston yeah. Police Department. We certainly do when we have, and, and your office has been great at identifying specific areas of concern. Um, when we have those locations, we uh, flag them for the police department. Um, what we have heard is that their staffing, their own staffing challenges have made, make it very difficult to do sustained enforcement efforts. And what we have seen in the data is in places where there has been a period of sustained enforcement, unfortunately, frequently after a tragedy has taken place, mm -hmm. that um, as soon as that enforcement stops, that uh, motorist behavior goes back to the way it was in terms of speeding. So. We don't look at um, you know, police enforcement as being a primary tool for how to increase safety and reduce, um, and reduce speeding, but we do think it is part of the puzzle. 
Um, what I will say is that there is legislation at the state that would legalize automated enforcement in Massachusetts. This is something that many other states have done to great success. New York has a program focused specifically around school zones um, that has been extremely successful in reducing repeat offenses. Um, we would love to do that in Boston. We are strongly supportive of legislation that would allow us to do that, but we need our friends on Beacon Hill to act before we can uh, start that process. And thank you, Chair. I've run out of time, but I will, um, after this meeting offline, I'd love to talk more about the West Roxbury Road Diet and Rutherford Circle, but I know my Absolutely. time is up here, so thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Councilor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilor President Flynn. And thank you, Madam Chair. Again, thank you to the panel. Uh, pedestrian safety has been probably the top issue I've been focused on over the last several years. Um, I advocated for blinking pedestrian signs, um, including rapid flash beacon, like we have on Summer Street or State Street. Um, raised crosswalks, speed humps, I know we've, we have very few in South Boston. Um, I've been advocating for them, haven't received them. Um, I think a speeding car is a public, a public health emergency. We need to lower the speed limit, but also more enforcement with Boston public, with Boston police as well. Um, I'm also concerned about some of the changes on shutting down streets. As, as you know, Chief, is, is a major concern I have in the Back Bay and other areas. Residents have said to me, shutting down streets, especially in the summertime, prevents emergency vehicles from, from getting down there and going around, um, taking extra time for a fire truck or police or ambulance. So um, I just want to be on the record. I'm, I'm really against shutting down any street because it impacts public safety. Um, so I've been waiting patiently for speed, um, speed humps and really haven't had any success other than a handful of streets in South Boston. Um, when, are, when are we going to start implementing them? Um, Councillor, there are two zones in, your, in South Boston um, that are in design uh, now um, that cover a significant portion of the residential neighborhood in South Boston. Um, we are in the design process right now and finalizing our construction contracts. So I want to be cautious about giving you a specific time until we have all the kind of pieces in place we need to deliver, but we are aiming to do construction this year. We've had a lot of um, traffic accidents in, in South Boston as well. I actually even think there was an accident again on Dorchester Street in Old Colony Avenue today. Um, Cars are going down that street on, on Dorchester Street. I live on the top of Dor Dorchester Street. Cars are going down that, that street 40, 50 miles an hour. Um, so I really need, I, I, I would like for us to reduce the speed limit to 20 miles an hour. I know people disagree with me. Um, but we really need to do something about that intersection, Dorchester Street, Oak Colony Avenue. It's unsafe for seniors, unsafe for persons with disabilities, there's a lot of kids going to public school in and around that area as well. Um, let me go on to traffic enforcement, but also I want to work with you, Chief. I think it's time in South Boston that we have um, resident parking. Too many people are coming to the neighborhood, especially in the summertime, in, in, in parking for the entire weekend and with almost no enforcement in the community, especially in the summertime. Um, so I think it's time for us to work together to implement resident parking throughout the entire neighborhood, not just a, a portion of it like it currently is. Is this something you will work with me on? Uh, yes, we're happy to work with you on it. Um, I will say our ability to expand resident parking enforcement has been challenged by our staffing levels. We are below 100 uh, parking uh, enforcement uh, uh, personnel. Um, a full complement is about 160, uh, and those numbers have been trending down continuously over the last few years. 
Um, I am happy to say that uh, under uh, Deputy Chief Gove's leadership, we have uh, begun the process of uh, recruiting our, what will be our first new class of parking enforcement uh, officials in, I think, four years. Um, the, uh, the, we, we have recently posted uh, a large number of positions. We've had over 70 applicants. Uh, our intent is to hire this class and train them, and when they are on the force, to then hire the next one and the next one and the next one until we get back to full strength. And as we do that, that creates the ability for us to expand enforcement and expand resident parking in your neighborhood and others that have uh, been waiting patiently to, uh, to see this change. So um, the short answer is yes, we will work with you on this. Thank you. I, I know a lot of the workers that work in parking enforcement, they do a ter terrific job. Again, I, I mentioned this in my, my opening comments. I, I think they don't get paid the salary that they, they, they deserve. I also think a lot of people across the city, whether they're residents or tourists or, or people just coming in, I don't think they treat them with respect either. And it's very discouraging because I know a lot of these, a lot of them are women as well. And just the harassment they face by people is concerning to me. It's, it's disturbing actually. And um, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like for us to see if we're able to do a public announcement, community announcement about how how important they are to the residents of Boston. They're our neighbors. They're our. Um, they're active in our community. They're our friends. They're, they're they're respected in the neighborhoods, but they just they just get treated with with a, with disrespect, and it's it's very concerning to me. And um, I've really had it with people that are taking their frustrations out on traffic enforcement um, professionals. Is this something we can do about maybe doing a public awareness, ish, a public awareness announcement, talking about the important role they play in our city? Um, I, I, we're absolutely happy to look at that, and I could not agree with you more that these are um, essential public servants who not only work hard but provide a really crucial safety function. Right, this is not just about convenience of parking, but it's about making sure that our fire hydrants are clear, that crosswalks mm -hmm. are not blocked. And uh, having uh, those folks do that work, no, none of them deserve to be treated with disrespect or threats uh, or the other kinds of actions that we see. So um, yeah, we, we share that uh, commitment to try to make sure that they are, are treated with dignity. And I'm happy to look at opportunities to convey that message to them more broadly. Thank you. My final point, something I've focused on probably the last six years, pest control. Not, not a sexy issue as far as city government is concerned, but an important issue, one of the issues I receive the most calls on probably. I know the city of Boston does a terrific job on pest control related issues. What I would like to see is a designated um, structured department that specifically deals with rodent mitigation, such as New York recently implemented uh, three months ago. Um, again, the city of Boston employees do a, tr a tremendous job on it, but I want to coordinate this, this department, these, this, this outreach to one specific department um, because it's an, it's an issue that's, that's a public health issue, it's a public safety issue, it's a quality of life issue. It's impacting residents in Alston and Brighton, South Boston, Chinatown, Roxbury, High Park. It's impacting every neighborhood. What can we do as a city to try to work together to designate one department that can oversee rodent mitigation? Um, I know that there are conversations happening within the leadership uh, of uh, the administration about this question. I, I can't, I mean, I think the, the, the exactly what you're asking for is, is, is sort of why I can't give a definitive answer as a single uh, uh, cabinet chief, but uh, I, you know, it's very clear that the issues that, um, that, that connect to uh, rodent infestations are, are cross-departmental. They relate to streets and waste, they relate to buildings, they relate to our inspection regimes and our, the fines around site cleanliness. Uh, you know, they relate to water and sewer. Uh, all of these need to be at the table. So 
Um, those conversations have been happening. We, I, I met with uh, some of my peers earlier this week to talk about this, and uh, so I think we are, we are working on an answer to that uh, request. Could, could I just get a, or I asked the administration if I could get a update, a briefing on exactly what's happening with rodent control, pest control, and if um, maybe sometime next week if I could um, meet with a group of um, city employees that are working on that. Uh, I'll make sure that our intergovernmental relations team uh, takes that request. Uh, thank you, Chief, and thank you to the panel for the important leadership and important work that you're providing the residents of Boston. Thank you, Council President. I am taking over for the chair. Um, putting myself on a time. So, um, all right, so I just have a few questions, and I am curious, I want to talk a little bit about the um, roll diet in West Roxbury. I've been getting a lot of calls in regards to process there. Um, it was something that was uh, initiated in 2019, and then it went on pause, and then, you know, there's been a upheaval around that. So I'm just curious from a process standpoint and a community engagement um, process, uh, um, kind of like processes. Can you just talk to me a little bit about kind of how we're moving forward with that and the role community is playing in, in helping to inform your decisions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, uh, the, the safety project that we are uh, working to implement on Center Street in West Roxbury um, was announced just this past weekend in the form of a flyer that was sent to residents of West Roxbury uh, in proximity of the corridor and obviously has received some public uh, attention and interest uh, in uh, local press. Um, so we have a meeting uh, next Wednesday uh, on the 31st at the uh, Orenburger, Orenburger School that will be a uh, public meeting that uh, for, uh, for anyone who's interested to attend. Um, we'll walk through what uh, the scope of the project is and some of the areas where we need that public input. Uh, we also have drop-in sessions uh, that are planned at the, um, at the, the West Roxbury uh, Boston Public Library branch on Center Street. Uh, I believe there are three sessions, two general public, one uh, intended for small businesses, uh, and we have a website and an email address set up where folks can provide feedback. Um, there are some aspects of this project that we have sort of based on the uh, safety challenges on Center Street and uh, the history of the work that has been done in 2019 and subsequent analysis and design work, um, this street needs to be reduced from four lanes to three. Uh, the majority of drivers on Center Street are speeding. Um, on some parts of the street, including those closest to the Linden School and the YMCA, uh, we see thousands of drivers a day going over 30 miles an hour in an area with unsignalized crosswalks and many pedestrians in the heart of this business district. Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you. I'm also curious, I've heard from residents um, in West Roxbury talk about ways and how people are utilizing this GPS to cut through different streets and kind of like the impact that this roll diet would have on just the added stress for these residential streets. Yeah, so I mean, navigation apps are creating cut through traffic everywhere uh, in the city. Um, you know, I will say when we do the analysis of a change in a street from four lanes to three, where we add turning lanes, where we create a more organized road, the volumes of traffic on Center Street can be handled efficiently with a three-lane road configuration. It is well below the thresholds of concern in terms of traffic volumes that, that, that don't work at three lanes. So we are not anticipating substantial uh, push of traffic onto neighborhood streets that is not already there, but one of the areas where we do need input from the community is those streets of most concern. You know, we want to hear, we have heard from a few folks when we've talked to them about the project of them saying, oh, you know, my, when, you know, when I don't want to drive on center or I want to, you know, take a shortcut, this is the route I use. Understanding that is helpful to us. We will do before and after monitoring on areas of concern and can follow on the project on Center Street with other traffic calming on adjacent streets if we see that there's evidence that traffic is That's moving great. there. That's great. So I'm going to move on to uh, two more um, issues that I see as a, at large city councilor. I hear from different people about different issues that are happening on their streets. And there seems to be the sentiment that it's bikes versus people. Like there's a tension here. Um, 
some folks in Eggleston Square with the center uh, by Columbus with the center bus lane, the same conversation that you're hearing around um, American Legion Highway, Cummings, Mattapan. And it seems like a lot of these projects have bubbled up and sometimes they just have appeared. And there is a tension there that I've heard from a lot of community residents and I'm just curious around this issue of class, right? There is this perceived notion that people who are on bikes are, you know, the young professionals. And so I'm just curious, like, what is your communication strategy to helping people understand kind of what this moment is calling for and how do people who have been longtime residents here in the city of Boston feel like they're occupying space and not feeling like all of their spaces are being um, eh, occupied by those who have more class and more access to resources and you know there seems to be a class issue when it comes to all of this redesign so I'm, that's the point of tension that I'm seeing yeah um, so I mean I think there are I, I, I don't disagree that that dynamic comes up um, in any well in many of the projects where we make changes to streets I will say you know you you, you open by talking about Eggleston and uh, the work that's been done there um, that actually has, uh, folks in the cycling community are very upset with that project because there was no accommodation made for bikes. Um, that project was focused uh, uh, exclusively on pedestrian safety and the bus. Um, and when we look at the lines that travel through Eggleston, uh, they are uh, majority used by uh, lower, our lower income Bostonians, they are majority people of color. Um, that project represents a rededication of street space from people who drive, who uh, on average are higher income, uh, to people who ride the bus who on average are lower income than those who drive. Um, so I would argue that a project like that is, uh, you know, to the extent that it, there is an element of class in that, it is that we have um, made a very deliberate choice to uh, support, um, you know, people who uh, have less uh, and to give them more of our public space and our public resources. So it's similar to the conversation on Blue Hill Ave, where, you know, we have 10,000 people a day, over 10,000 people a day taking the bus on Blue Hill Ave. Um, these are not... Some of these people drive as well. Many of these people cannot afford to drive in the city, and we are trying to make sure that they can get where they need to go quickly and efficiently and not be stuck in traffic behind the people Thank who you. can drive. Yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about the Mathers School. I know we sent mm -hmm. out an email um, in regards to some of the traffic control um, issues that they're experiencing there. So I'm just curious from the moment that you receive an email or a request, what is the turnaround? Uh, status for feedback for folks? Is there any feedback so that we can manage everybody's expectations about how you decide to move forward if you decide to move forward at all? And then the last question that I have is in regards to your, um, this is more for public works, I'm curious about your um, personnel of color, kind of like how are we ensuring that black and brown uh, employees are moving up the ladder because there was a lot of discrepancies there. Um, when we filed our Fair Chance Act. And then I'm curious about um, minority businesses and the contracting opportunities that you are providing to people of color. Mm -hmm. Those are the last three questions that I have. Okay. Um, so we are looking into the Mather School. Uh, we just, that just made it to our cabinet, I believe, on Monday. So um, we are, uh, uh, Nick uh, has that uh, in his uh, cue, uh, the issues that were identified, uh, we think are largely around signage and uh, properly identifying a school zone. So the engineering team is looking at what is doable there under the signage guidelines that we are required to follow, but we certainly want to address any issues with, um, with signage or, or uh, challenges there. Um, you know, I can say I, I'm certainly happy to let Mike speak in general to public works staffing, but um, across the cabinet, it is crucially important for us to make sure that we are creating pathways for opportunities for uh, people of color, for all people within the cabinet, but especially recognizing the um, you know, historic discrepancies of, of who has what jobs um, within the city. We uh, you know, are working to make sure that... So uh, I, need, I need specifics. Like, I know you're saying that you're working towards it, but we filed an ordinance and passed it, and it's the Fair Chance Act, which holds us accountable to that work. 
and we even hired, um, as a result of that work, a chief diversity officer to help support. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know specifically what are we doing to meet the mandate around that. I know we're working towards it, but it would be helpful to get some things on the record around what that work looks like. Um, I'm not sure that I'm prepared to, to answer specifically to the, um, the, the specifics of the Fair Chance Act and how that's playing out. You know, we are working in the context of the, with the People Operations Cabinet uh, of the city to make sure that we're giving all of our hiring managers and uh, the people who are in a position to um, you know, develop talent within our uh, cabinet uh, the tools that they need to do that, that we can hire in ways understanding that much of our hiring process is promotional process is constrained by our collective bargaining agreements and the uh, ways in which those operate. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone who's in a position of decision-making power has knowledge about how to um, do hiring in ways that are unbiased and to uh, provide the tools that they need to help lift up uh, members of the workforce who show promise and potential to uh, grow within the cabinet. I mean, it is certainly always our goal to promote from within and to uh, recognize the incredible talent we have at every level and to make sure that we're giving people opportunities for advancement. And how many people have been promoted from within? Um, I cannot give you a specific answer to that question, and we have to talk about what time frame and um, what and roles, but I'm happy to give you, uh, we're happy to gather additional data for you if you would like. I would appreciate that, and then I'm also curious about the minority businesses in terms of contractual services and the role that you all are playing to help the mayor reach her equity mm -hmm. alleged standpoints around yeah. access for all people of color. Mike, do you want to speak to some of the things we've been doing? Yeah. So I, I could jump in on the on the public works operational side of the um, RMB work. We've we've uh, we actually put together a set of contracts for stairs and footpaths. We we all talk about stairs and footpaths. They're either, you know decrepit in the summer and they're and they're falling apart. Um, Power does great work to put them back together in the winter. We have to maintain them for snow and ice control, um, and that was something that was largely done inside internal um, folks for public works. Um, with the staffing issues we've had, we've had to kind of figure out. How do we keep everything safe in the winter? But how do we do it with resources? So um, I'm, I'm going to butcher the term, Omar, but we, but we were able to place these contracts that we actually created um, for these stairs and footpaths into a separate sheltered market. And in that sheltered market, we were able to find um, four different contractors. They took on the contracts this past year. We, we actually wrote the contracts. From Boston? From, from, yep, yep. All from, uh, two are from Boston, one's in Everett. Yep. Um, the, the, this was the first year we did, it, we did one year contracts to kind of see this is, this is all new to us, kind of uh, farming out some of our work and, tr tr you know, usually we do contractor work, um, you know, redundantly, whether it be trash pickup or, or our larger streets. This, is, this was a bit more, uh, uh, a smaller inventory of um, assets that we own and maintain. We had a good winter with them. We didn't have a real winter to really speak to. Um, but so the, the, that worked, that, that worked very well. Um, to find, and uh, working with Omar's team, his previous team, to find some contractors who, who actually do this work. Some of them had contracts already with either D&D &D or BRA or some smaller work. And then as I uh, noted earlier with the uh, mattress contract, we, we had that problem, we had to fit, solve it. Um, we, we also used some of the work that we had already kind of initiated through that sheltered marketplace work. This was not put in the sheltered marketplace, but we put these two contracts out to bid. Uh, it splits the city in half for, um, for all mattress collections. This is a three-year contract, um, and one was awarded to an MBE. Um, I believe the total was $3.8 million um, over three years. Um, I, one of the largest MBE contracts given out operationally, um, and it was, it, was, it was born from the relationship that started in the sheltered marketplace conversation, um, and we're, we're obviously looking to grow on that and, and uh, build. We've had, I'll say it's been five, five or six months, it's been... January, middle of January, they kind of hit the road. So we've had, yeah, five months of good work. Um, and we're hoping that, you know, as we, as we give these companies city work, they have city dollars and they can hopefully grow and take on other things and we can look at them in other avenues and other, in, in our other work. Thank you. Um, Councilman here, your time is up, but I know that your time is limited. You have a yes. previous commitment. Yes. Um, so if you like to give your closing remarks. And Thank you, Chair, and I just want to say thank you. I know I came across, I've been upgraded from a Chihuahua to a German Shepherd now, 
I think it's more befitting. Yeah, I was a Chihuahua, now I am a German Shepherd. They're smart, loyal, They're smart, strong. Loyal, exactly. I used to say Beautiful. I, I used to bark a lot, okay. but now I'm a German Shepherd, which is what I'm so deeply afraid of because that's what bit me when I was a kid. But anyways, um, I am. my job is to uh, be the checks and balances on the council, right? Um, also, just, Chihuahuas are, are all bark, no, no oh, bite. really? Yeah, so. Um, so my job on the council, especially as a city council at large, is to um, make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable um, and that we are the ones that are, are supposed to be the ones who approve this budget. And it's a big budget, right? And I think what I have seen in the last three years that I've been here is that we have these hearings, we learn, you come, you talk about all of the amazing things that you're doing, then we come back and then we hear and then we ask all these questions and then we hope and pray that things are getting done in ways that are equitable. And I would love um, to see a dashboard of sorts from this particular department that assesses from the moment a neighborhood um, requests a service to the outcome of that service that does not, um, maybe 311 may have it, but I, I do believe that there's an opportunity for you all to learn to see how you are responding to the needs of community um, in a way that people will believe that we are really listening to those who don't vote and are um, least engaged in the process because I still see that those who have the most financial resources, those who actually have the voting higher um, percentage of voters in their neighborhoods, those are the people that tend to still get their issues heard and processed. And unless they call one of us, um, they're oftentimes a lot of their requests still fall in deaf ears. And I just wanna note that for the record and I'm looking forward to working alongside you and your team to fix that problem. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, um, Customer here. Appreciate you and your advocacy. Council, um, Brian uh, Rorell has joined us and um, Councilor Coletta and, and Councilor Worrell, if you allow me to um, just take things in order, we'll do part, uh, virtual testimony, only a couple people in line. Um, you are actually next after me. I will pull back my time, allow virtual testimony so we can stay on schedule as I promised the public, and then we'll go straight. I will yield my time, go to Councilor Coletta and then Councilor Worrell, and then we'll wrap up. We originally said um, so much for an hour, an hour and a half, but. Um, next time. I owe you one. <laughs> Do we have names? Oh, you put them in already. Thank you. And um, for uh, my colleagues, or those of you watching, um, so for this committee, I actually hold it a little bit differently. I like to prioritize public testimony because they have to wait for so long. So it's usually just one round or they, I allow them to go first. Um, we're in round of questioning and if uh, folks arrive late, then I allow the public to go on time and then counselors next. Um, Ms. Uh, Radwin. I, I received your letter, if you can hear, if you can hear us. Whenever you're ready. Um. Uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Can you hear me? Hi, Lori. Hi. You can hear me. I can hear you. How are you? I'm well. How are you, Counselor? I'm good, thank you. Um, please, your name, your uh, affiliation or residence. I received your letter, but uh, look forward to hearing your lovely voice. <laughs> thank you for the compliment. My name is Lori Radman. I'm a coordinator of the Rosendale Coalition. And my testimony is gleaned from the concerns of my coalition members. I want to thank the chief and all the panel in advance for your attention, as well as the counselors. There are some bold expenditures in the transportation department's budget, and bold expenditures require impeccable accountability. In other words, metrics, or as uh, Councilor Mejia calls it, a dashboard. And I'm going to talk about three important examples of how accountability could be measured. So let's start with bike lanes. Uh, I think from page 81 of the mayor's budget, 
There's $17.3 million appropriated for bike lanes. Um, the rationale for this expenditure requires careful scrutiny because I've listened to working sessions and public hearings about how amendments should be written, how money should be spent, and there's an importance of funding for housing, returning citizens, et cetera. So it would be good to see some metrics. And I would suggest a pre and post data analysis for the bike lanes that have been completed. And one metric would be the number of bicycle riders per uh, bicycle rider hours per week for each of the two bike lane systems in my area, including the American Legion Highway bike lanes. And there's a bike lane at the Arbor Way and Center Street in Rosendale JP. So it'd be really interesting to hear how many bicycle rider hours per week there have been over the past year. We have a metric for unintended consequences, which would be the amount of time it takes for a car to travel the length of each of these bike lanes. You may not have pre and post data, but a survey of current users would at least provide a subjective metric. Number two is dedicated bus lanes. And you know, I agree with your testimony about who takes buses and speeding up the buses during rush hour traffic is a good thing. Dedicated lanes are worthy. However, there are costs when you block off bus lanes from parking and cars and it affects residents quality of life. So um, there are the bus lanes in our area in Rosendale run from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. one way. And I've asked for some measurements of how much bus travel time is uh, um, uh, ex expediated, how much faster a bus goes between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning that justifies um, shutting off that lane. Similarly, the other way, it goes from 2P to 7P, and I'd be very interested in the data that shows that buses are accelerated between 2P and 3P when you have bus lanes. Because what's happening is people, residents are pitted against residents for parking, and I have one coalition member who's already received three tickets in, um, in uh, one week. Uh, I have asked for this from, the, from your transit team director. I've put in a public information request and not gotten anything. Okay, my last uh, idea is parking spaces in the core business district. And to someone's earlier remark, I described last year that there were 31 parking spaces in the Rosalind Dale Square commercial district that were either lost or reduced to 15 minute parking as a result of um, Boston Transportation Department projects. At present, the core business district has more than 10 empty or dark storefronts. Although there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between loss of customer parking and loss of businesses, it does beg the question, how do you attract new businesses to an area when there's not sufficient customer parking? And to your credit, the Transportation Department, and specifically Matt Warfield, has gathered both quantitative and qualitative data to look at a parking plan for the core district and I'm gonna ask you to look into something else. I'm gonna ask the transit department to please work with the BPDA's transportation planner. And this is my last uh, request. As of today, there are four BPDA and four, in, they, four developments have been approved by the BPDA and the ZBA, and they each have less than one-to-one -one parking spaces per unit. Each, each building you're going, well, it's only a few less. Well, there's a cumulative effect. And in fact, for these four buildings, there will be 75 to 77 fewer off-street parking spaces than residential units within these buildings once these are built. Considering that each unit may in fact have one car owning resident, each apartment or condo may have one, there are about that many cars that are gonna need street parking spaces. And clearly there's gonna be more competition again with Rosendale Square business customers and owners. So in summary, um, I look at the transportation budget and I think it will support some bold plans for change. And I think metrics are and accountability are what needs to go together with those bold expenditures. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Radwin. Always a pleasure hearing from you. you. Um, we have in person uh, Ms. Catherine Friedman. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Is thank you. Your name, your? Uh, Catherine Friedman, I'm a Leather District resident. Um, thank you for all of the great work you all do. Um, I really appreciate it. I just have a couple of questions though, and we have been in touch about some, some safety issues in the leather district. Um, but a question I have is when you mentioned um, that the speed, bump, the speed humps would be going on the residential streets as opposed to the arterial, what happens when you have 
arterial streets that are, are also residential, like Lincoln Street in the, in the Leather District, like Neyland Street in Chinatown. How do you address pedestrian safety when you have um, those conflicts? And then um, the second question I'll ask is, um, you did mention that you would um, identify areas of concern to um, BPD for traffic enforcement. Is there, uh, um, one, one concern that I have is, um, can the communication also go the other way? So for instance, when BPD was uh, in the Leather District back in February, they issued 410 citations for failure to stop at Lincoln Street and, and Beach Street over a two week period, and yet there was no means of uh, sending that data to um, the transportation department. Is there a way to make sure that that communication is, is two ways? so that if enforcement recognizes a, a safety issue, um, that you can potentially address it through better street design. Ms. Freeman, I would say that um, this uh, format is actually for public testimony, and that your questions, um, I can ask them to submit them in writing. Okay. If you email me, happy to send you the responses. I will do that. I just wanted to make sure that those do go on record, because I think that those are important questions that a Absolutely. lot of people probably want answered. Absolutely. So, did thank you, you. Did you want to make a closing remark? Uh, no, I just want those questions to be out there and recognized. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much, Ms. Freeman. Um, next, we have Kathy McCabe. Thank you, Councillor uh, and Madam Chair. My name is Kathy McCabe, and I'm the president of the Longfellow Area Neighborhood Association in uh, Roslindale. And we have um, we have been very concerned about Walter Street and um, uh, trans uh, needing a, uh, accommodations that are safer for pedestrians, as well as slowing down traffic. I want to say that. Uh, um, Chief uh, Joshua Franklin Hodge has been um, responsive, but we were disappointed not to have Walter Street for, um, included in planning f um, for Walter Street and the five intersections that we have problems with in, in our neighborhood uh, addressed in the budget. So we, um, Councilor Lara and Councilor um, uh, Royal had both requested uh, some planning money so that we could have an overall plan so we don't have unintended consequences. So I would like to urge uh, the City uh, Ways and Means Committee to consider incorporating $250,000 in the budget. I think this uh, aligns with two of the pillars uh, the Chief talked about including um, people of all ages and all abilities to uh, freely move. Uh, right now, uh, Walter Street sidewalks have never been improved for at least 80 years, and they are trip hazards and hazardous to people in wheelchairs, um, parents walking, and others with strollers and children, as well as elders. Um, it also is important as to shifting how we move and uh, and right now people don't want to walk uh, or cross Walter Street because it, uh, it's not safe, sight lines are poor, we really need a comprehensive solution for it. Uh, so I'm, I'm here to urge the council to consider that and to incorporate that please in the budget. I also want to thank um, BTD and um, Boston um, Public Works uh, on core services in our section of the city. Uh, I feel like they've improved uh, and, um, you know, things like snow plowing, even, um, even when we had a light winter, but uh, um, the year before it's been much better. So uh, it's in an upward tra tra trajectory, but we still think Walter Street is really important. And we've been advocating for this for a long time. Uh, it's seven years, so we'd really like to be heard and we'd really like some more response. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the work uh, you as the council, 
as well as BTD Public Works uh, um, leadership, as well as the people on the street um, do for our city and our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. McCabe. Um, as, I, as I said, it's, it's my turn for questions, but um, I'll let you go first and then uh, Council Orell, and then I'll wrap us up. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I'm, I've been very excited to um, jump into my line of questioning. Um, but before I do that, I know that I'm not supposed to have a favorite cabinet, but um, y'all are pretty much up there. So, but environment, energy, open space. Did you, did civic, you hear that, MOH? Uh, MOH, <laughs> we love you too. But um, no, you all, uh, your work is the bread and butter of, of city government. It doesn't get the headlines to fix the bricks and the sidewalks, to fix the signals. Um, or to install a crosswalk, but it is something that I get calls every single day in my district. It's very walkable, and so people are calling me all the time, sending in 311 requests, so I am on the phone with all of you, including Commissioner Brohl, who helped me um, with, uh, with a make safe in the North End just the other day. Um, and to be consistent, too, I, I just want to thank everybody uh, who has helped my office. So the unofficial mayor of East Boston, Lenny Curtis, um, and Carlos Hokies in East Boston, Ty Jackson, Commissioner Brohl. Um, Eric Prentice is a treasure and should be protected at all costs. Um, Clarence has helped me with snow in the past, so thank you to that. Um, I know John Vazella just uh, left the department, but he was great. Pada, um, Sal, Santo Stefano, and, and everyone else here. I'm, I'm sorry if I missed you, but just thank you so much for your work. Um, I'm surprised that I was the first one to ask this, or I might not be, but. Um, we have to, when we're charged with amending the budget, um, trying to figure out where to pull from. And so I'm wondering, because we really didn't have any snow this year, what is left over? Like, where, where does that line item live um, in the budget, and how much is, is left? And has that already been allocated to an expenditure? Good question. Um, I can't give you the number right now. Um, but we can get back to you on that because we are closing out all the invoices from the last season. I would say, because I also was worked in the budget office in my previous life, um, the snow budget is a separate uh, appropriation. So it's not actually part of the, the public works budget, although it is primarily spent by public works. And so at the end of the year, it's actually administered centrally. And so okay. when there is a large surplus in the past, what we have done is we purchased snow vehicles, for example, uh, we have to use it for kind of snow-related appropriations um, by law, um, but that's how it has been used in the past. Um, and it's also, you know, gone back into the city's general fund and for other things, but I don't know. I can't speak to that. You'll have to ask. Okay, Central so we have to spend it on snow appropriations. Uh, that's how that. we, you know, per the, or, you know, per the city's charter, I think we, we, I mean, I don't know. I can't answer that specifically, but that's how we have spent it in the past. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, through the chair, if I can ask for that uh, piece of information. Uh, I appreciate that, though. Um, I want to get into long-term repaving and sidewalk repair. This has been a top priority of mine. I did, um, sorry, I did need clarification in terms of the, that budget being um, administered centrally, not in capital. It's not in capital, it's operating. So there's, there's, there's funding where? So it's actually, it should be in your packet, but there is an department at org called snow um or I forget well the there's one in there's one in your department called snow removal correct so that's where power works primarily but um boston public schools and um housing use it a little bit or primarily used by our plowing contracts except it says zero across the way i'm sorry the numbers the money says zero does it say zero yes oh okay so i think what you're looking at is there's a line in each department's budget that says snow removal, but there's actually a central... No, um, only yours. Only in ours? Okay. I think the way, it, I'll tell you the way it works, is that we spend out of that line, but the money then gets transferred from a different budget called snow cleaning or clearing. Okay. And so, I'll look for it. Sure. But please, when, whatever you have in details, resetting the clock. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, Long-term uh, repaving and sidewalk repair, this has been a priority of mine. Um, I'm curious to know what the average mileage of streets uh, that get repaved are every year, if you have a benchmark or level of success. Um, what goes into the planning process into what streets get repaved and, and what sidewalks get repaved? My understanding is um, that there was a benchmark of attempting to do 50 miles per year, at least for the streets. Are we meeting that? 
And if so, and if not, why not? Um, so that's a good question. I think we, um, and I'll see if Para has anything that he would like to add on this, but generally speaking, um, we are, to my knowledge, right, our paving project is, our paving program is, is sort of tied to budget and the funding that's allocated to it. So we're able to look at uh, a given pool of funding that we have available to us, bid that out uh, based on the sort of network of streets that we've identified that we think are uh, the highest priority uh, streets for repaving. Uh, and then the available funding dictates sort of how much we're able to get done. The actual prioritization process is um, it, fairly data driven. We do, um, we survey about a quarter of the city every year for to determine pavement quality index. We then mesh that data with what we know about upcoming utility projects. Um, there are frequently uh, projects that are uh, in some cases, um, you know, we, we, are, we know are coming, but uh, trying to pin down uh, some of our utilities as to exactly when can be a yep. challenge. So, um, but what we attempt to do for the repaving work is to create uh, the, the map that intersects the streets most in need with the streets that we know are not about to be torn up and put that into the paving program. There are other things though that we try to factor in with paving. First of all, some projects that we do, corridor projects. Um, you know, we're in the midst of reconstructing Tremont Street in the South End for safety bus and bike improvements. Um, when that project is complete, most of that street will be fully repaved as part of that project, um, simply because so much has been torn up in the course of, of building that project that we, we need to do uh, paving uh, there. There's also an intersection between our um, uh, accessible uh, pedestrian ramp work and paving uh, frequently to achieve ADA compliance mm -hmm. on a ramp and the appropriate slopes. We actually need to repave an area around the ramp, but we try to, when we know that we're doing a large number of ramps in a neighborhood and there are significant paving needs, we try to make sure we align the timing of those so that they happen together. So there's a lot of factors that go into that, um, that work, but ultimately it's a plan that we put together each year to, to, to look at the, the, the coming season and what we can build. When is that plan usually finalized ahead of the, the working season? And um, can we get access to that? And yeah. just get a list of what's happening in our neighborhood, understanding that things happen, yep. and you don't really want to push them out, but it would yeah. be helpful for us to know exactly what's happening. So, so I will say um, this is an area where we have some work to do in terms of how far in advance that planning is happening. Um, historically, going back you know, five, 10 years ago, the city was publishing a multi-year plan. Um, we have not done that in some time. Um, you know, our core repaving program streets were only uh, finalized at the start of this construction season, so it's only, we've only had those for about a month. Um, we definitely can look at publishing that map, um, you know, in a publicly accessible way. I think, you know, long term, our goal is to, I shouldn't even say long term, medium term, our goal is to get back to the place where we have uh, proactive multi-year pavement planning uh, happening. Um, we are challenged by the uh, incredible uh, headcount uh, issues we have within our uh, engineering teams, one of which sits within construction and the, yep. having the resources to do How that. How many people do you think you need to hire within that department for you to get back up to the levels that we can get our, our streets? I don't have the current vacancy count within the construction division mm -hmm. off the top of my head. Um, overall, across the cabinet, though, uh, you know, we are short dozens of engineers. And Why is that? Are we not paying them enough? Uh, I think there's a variety of factors, right? Everyone is struggling to hire in the current labor market, um, historically low unemployment rates. Uh, I think salary can be a factor. It is, you know, we do have residency requirements here, which obviously create a higher um, you know, cost base for somebody who uh, would be working for the city uh, versus another employer yep. if they're not already a city resident. Um, and uh, I think we, you know, we simply, this is a, uh, we're, we're in a moment of, uh, you know, tremendous amount of federal money coming into infrastructure and, um, you know, despite all the challenges we've had in recent years, an economy that is absolutely booming. And uh, so that creates, at every level, a competition for talent. I mean, yep. we struggle to hire people to 
uh, you know, to draw, to operate our heavy vehicles. Uh, and Hokies, yeah. too. Hokies, and if, if I can't uh, interrupt you, because yep. I only have so much time, <laughs> yep. I'm sorry. Right ahead. Um, yeah. Hokies, we need a ton of more Hokies. East Boston is littered with trash. I just started this trash initiative, and I've been in direct contact with, um, with your department. Um, we desperately need to pay them more. They can't afford to live here. They can yep. make more money scooping ice cream at J.P. Licks. Yeah. why would they go and scoop up trash on our streets? So that's something that I hope is being um, fixed. And you, then- you, you stole my talking point, uh, word for word for-, uh, for uh, JP Licks and everything? <laughs> JP yeah. Licks and everything for, uh, for, the, uh, for some of the work we need to do around our, our pay scales and Thank assessment. Thank you. So. And including um, brick layers as well too. I, I have the North End in, in East Boston. Um, we're simply not fixing our bricks enough or, or fast enough, rather. And my understanding is that we need to hire for eight more um, bricklayers. Is, is that true? So um, actually, at, at the, the rating for that job is called Craftsman. That's, we have 13 across the city, went in full. We have four right now. Okay. So um, we are down nine. Um, that, that carries uh, the ability to use tools effectively. Uh, drive heavy motor equipment off, you know, operate trucks, be able to load and uh, unload salt. Um, so, we, we, yeah, we're at four when we, when it fully staffed, we're at 13. So that kind of tells you, and that's a, that's a decent ratio as we look across that highway operation as well. Okay. Do, I have, do I have enough time for one more? Uh, sure. Okay, thank you, Chair, for your indulgence. Um, uh, Cobux, technology, parking regulations, all of that. Um, so I'm just going to push out there and, and encourage for Cobux 2.0 so that we could coordinate with utilities, um, being able to zoom out. I know that Cobux is a wonder in comparison to other municipalities, but the ability to see multiple things happening at once, especially in East Boston, Boston Water and Sewer, Eversource, National Grid, us coming in to pave the streets, as well as construction permits that take up sidewalks. Everything is happening all at once and nothing is talking to one another, and so having the ability, if it's simply just a GIS mapping system, and having Ed Harrisford be able to say, oh, this is happening on this curb, maybe we should do that, maybe we should push it back. Um, that's something that I would like for you all to work with it on. And then parking reg regulations, um, my understanding is that our enforcement officers, and I would like to see more in East Boston, um, our parking enforcement officers pass down through institutional knowledge where regulations are, because we don't have a system that tracks where our, our, what our signs are, you all use Google Maps. Is that correct? Um, we do use Google Maps as one of our tools, but you are correct that we do not have a full digital database, although that is a project that is actively underway and is it's funded ongoing. in this budget in coordination with Do It. Um, so we are working to build that database now. How much is that, is that costing us? Um, I don't have the exact number because it's been folded in with a larger do it initiative around asset management and inventory. So um, I think we, we can get that information for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Yep. Thank you. Um, I, do, I do have reference in the data that your snow removal funds comes from your highway field operation spending. So um, is that is a sort of a supplemental in addition to like contractual services that you need, then you go to the mayor when you large um, appropriation um, for snow. It's about 24 million a year. Yeah. That is not in the public works budget that we rely on. Okay. Thank you. Um, and to answer your question, Council Collada, there is no money left. It was spent. There's nothing, absolutely nothing. They're asking for an increase in every line item in that section. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councilor Borrell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel. I uh, just want to give a big shout out to Commissioner Bro, um, PJ, uh, Clarence Perkins, John Vizella, Eric Prentice, Robert Lewis, Brian Coffin, Willie Simon, uh, Carl McKenzie, and Pat Hoey, all who are very responsive and um, do credible, incredible work here in the city of Boston. Um, one of my first questions is Hokies. Uh, um, I know we advocated last year in the city council for Hokies, um, one in, I think we advocated for two each district, right? Um, where, where are we at with the Hokies inside of district four? So we, we have a total now uh, number of 21 full-time employee staffed positions for Hokies. We have four hired. Right. We've, we've hired, we've promoted some, we've 
some have not lasted. They've, they've either resigned or have been um, separated. Um, it's, it, it's, it's difficult to, um, Council Clatter and Chief Franklin Hodges' conversation about, you know, um, JP Licks, it's $16 an hour for a Hokie. Um, that's in the door. Um, so we're struggling in this, in this um, labor market, just like we are with specialty trained um, staff. So, but we are getting them in. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are interviewing actively the, you know, we're backed up so much in staffing that we're interviewing for every level. Okay. Um, and we're interviewing for uh, a whole, I, I'd say about 20 to 30 promotions that'll, that'll occur that'll also free up some positions. Some of those might be Hokies, so we might be, we might need, you know, 20 I know, Hokies if, you know, as these folks get, get promoted. You know, the, the coming in the door as a Hokie is great. I, there's folks up here right now who came in the door as Hokies and they now lead departments and divisions. And it's, it's, a, it's like, it's, it's how government should work. You get in, you find your way around, you clean streets, you, you, you're valuable to the neighborhood, and then you get into a career ladder and you move up. Um, we, have, we, have, we have senior leadership in this cabinet mm -hmm. of folks who, have, who, have, who, who were hired to do just that. Um, we're struggling with just getting them in now. Got it. And um, I know that the, I'm hearing from con, um, a lot of residents on bringing resident park, permit parking. Um, I know that has been put on pause. Can you um, feel like it's been put on pause now for about a year? Can you tell me where, um, what the plan is or your thought process on that? Uh, we need to get our enforcement staffing levels back closer to normal to be able to look at resuming or at adding additional resident parking. The last thing we want to do is put up signs that we know we don't have the capacity to enforce, and that's what we would be doing right now. So very much dependent on the pace at which we're able to hire people to do enforcement work. Uh, awesome. And then speaking about enforcement work, um, a lot of auto body shops um, inside of our district, and on the weekend, we get complaints left and right. Um, also, commercial vehicles parking on residential streets. Does District 4 Dorchester, do we have like enforcement on the weekends after 6 o'clock? Because it just feels like we're not getting the, the type of enforcement that, that we need in our, in our area. Sure. So to, to Chief's point, yeah, we're, you know, we're very limited with enforcement capacity right now. There is, we, we don't enforce um, on Sundays, obviously, as well as holidays. But we are strategically looking at um, some targeted enforcement uh, around all type of, types of different enforcement, like resident parking, um, you know, enforcement around uh, bike lanes, uh, double parking in, in uh, business districts. So. We, we're trying to work in some targeted areas right now uh, until we can get those, enforce, uh, those enforcement officer numbers up. Awesome. And you get, it's probably on your radar, but like the Talbot, Talbot uh, Norfolk, Triangle, um, uh, Morton Street on the, on the business side, and then also over there by um, uh, Blue Hill Ave, um, like right next to like Cafe Juice Up. Um, The other question is around sidewalks. Um, this is the other thing that neighbors reach out to me about, especially when the trees um, uplift the sidewalks, but also just regular cracks in the sidewalks. Is there a list, um, like a project list of sidewalks that need to be re um, reconstructed, and is that shared to the public, and how does that get determined? Yeah, so, you know, sidewalk work is, um, uh, is, is done, prioritized by a couple different ways. So one, we do have um, a queue of requests that have come in for sidewalk repairs. When we get those requests, the first thing we do is we look at whether there's a safety issue at place. Uh, and in some cases, and frequently what we find is we need to do a short-term patch, usually done with asphalt and uh, the highway division is uh, very responsive to those kinds of sort of make safe uh, concerns that we have. But all of those then go into a, a, a queue for long-term repair. Um, the last few years, because of the city's focus on uh, the uh, delivery of accessible ramps, um, something that's required under our consent decree, um, that has been where a lot of both our, our, our attention and our money has gone in terms of the kind of concrete work that 
um, that, that would also be used for sidewalks. Uh, so what we're doing right now is we're going through that backlog of requests. We are consolidating duplicates. We're taking out areas where we've already been able to do work so that we will have a clear queue of the things that residents have asked us to do. At the same time, because we know that we cannot just do ramps, that we need to also maintain our sidewalks, we've started to shift the way we're doing our major ramp projects so that we are doing what we call accessible neighborhood projects. Instead of just doing a series of ramps, we are going into whole series of streets and looking at all of the non-compliant ramps and all of the sidewalks that have accessibility or safety issues and doing them all together. Um, there's recently a series of streets in Roxbury that uh, have been completed uh, and one in JP that was done last year. Uh, there's another batch of those that are uh, planned for this year. So we're still, I think, trying to find, to be honest, the, the correct balance between doing the work in this kind of proactive neighborhood-wide way versus responding directly to complaints. Um, there was a, you know, a, a, a study that the city, or an analysis the city conducted, I want to say five or six years ago, that looked at where, our, where we had historically been very much more sort of focused on the responsiveness side. And when we looked at where, what actual sidewalk conditions were versus where complaints were coming from, what we found is that the rate of complaints correlated to the wealth of the neighborhood, not to the condition of the sidewalk. And so that led to a bit of soul searching about, you know, knowing that we get legitimate requests from every neighborhood in the city, we still need to maintain a capacity to respond, but we also need to be more proactive and be making these neighborhood-wide investments to make sure that we're not disproportionately putting money to where people are the most vocal, but not necessarily where the need is the greatest. Thank you. And then um, transitioning to one of my other favorite top topics is private ways. I don't believe that we should have private ways in the city of Boston and that we should just convert all the private ways, you know, free of charge, um, because we do own all the streets. Uh, but there's one street in particular um, that I would want to point to, Henrik Street. Um, and there are signs on Henrik Street, like stop signs, uh, do not park signs, but it's, I've been told it's considered a private way. So um, we'd love to, you know, awesome. Talk to PJ on that. All right. We, we, we've looked at that street in particular. I actually rode my bike down it this past weekend. Um, okay. And, uh, we, you know, Good to hear. It is, it is, mis, it is, it is missigned. Um, I mean, it should not have city parking regulation signs on it, if it is a, which it is a private way. So, right. But we can, so can we get city pavement since we had the signs? <laughs> so the signs do not change the legal ownership uh, of the street, unfortunately. Um, but I think we can, uh, we can look to see at least that it is safe and passable. Um, and uh, you know, I think there is a larger conversation that may have to involve the state legislature about how private ways in general can be bettered into public ways uh, and some of the ways that costs associated with that are, are born. All right, can I, one more question, Madam Chair. Um, the other one is a big co conversation that's going on, which is the Blue Hill Ave corridor. Um, center running bus lanes and what as a small business owner you know I, I i also shop on blue hell ave i go to cafe juice up um the dry cleaners but i don't take the bus there right i drive my car there and i just imagine everyone else that goes to cafe juice up takes their takes drives there um does, doesn't probably take the bus have you guys ever did a study to see what the impacts like how many customers um, in those businesses take the bus or drive to, to those businesses? I mean, uh, Consta, we, we haven't done a study, and I think that we are going to talk to uh, each and every business along the entire corridor to get a better understanding of uh, how their clientele travels to their location to, to do business. But it's, it's definitely something that we are looking at very closely as part of the overall uh, corridor redesign. Awesome. And um, I, I would just add to that, right? Like, I think there's sometimes this conversation sort of unfairly pits people against who ride the bus against local businesses. Part of what needs to happen on Blue Hill Ave is that it needs better organization. Um, there are, you know, if you look at the blocks of Blue Hill Ave, kind of just 
uh, down the hill from Cafe Juice Up as you get towards Morton Street, mm -hmm. right? There are places on Blue Hill Ave with businesses that have no visible parking regulation signs, right? Um, in places where there are regulation signs, there's often two hour parking in front of places where people are going in to get a smoothie, not stay and having dinner, right? So us organizing the curb, making sure that we're adapting the regulations to the needs of the local businesses is a huge part of the work that will happen in the Blue Hill Ave project. Um, whether whatever bus facilities we add, we know the street has to function for multiple purposes and multiple users, especially the local businesses. So that's a core part of the engagement we're doing around the project is to make sure we can design a street that works for everyone. One last question on the design. Um, and I've seen the design of center running bus lanes, um, but throughout the city I've seen dedicated bus lanes, whether to the right or to the left. However, I haven't seen that design being presented as one of the options in the Blue Hill Lab project. Um, is that option off the table for Blue Hill Lab, a uh, dedicated bus lane off to the right or to the left? I think generally when we look at uh, the way that bus lanes perform, what we see is that center running bus lanes are far more effective at the job they're supposed to do, which is to move people on the bus faster than side running bus lanes. This is especially true in dense business districts with a lot of demand for curb. I don't know if you've ever had occasion to travel on Brighton Ave in Alston uh, on an evening, but you will find that those side running bus lanes are not effective um, because of the amount of double parking in those lanes. Center running bus lanes tend to be self-enforcing. So it's a long-winded way of saying that I think, you know, we, our, our belief is that given the, the character of Blue Hill Ave and the way that different road users use it, that center running bus lanes would be a far more effective tool. Um, but we're happy to continue a conversation with you about what design options are there. And in fact, I think we have some time set up two weeks from now to talk um, with the mayor and others about where we're at in the project and, and the design. Awesome. And any data to support that center run, I mean, center run bus lanes are um, more efficient than side rider bus lanes? Sure. Thank you. You good? Thank you, Madam Chair. No problem. Um, my questions are similar to Council Rell's, and I guess um, from what I hear, the majority of the community is saying that they don't want the center bus lane. And if it's more efficient, then, it, you know, then can, can you prove it? Can you show us how can it be more efficient? People are afraid that they're going to lose parking, um, parking uh, spaces and not be able to shop in that business corridor? And if so, then what other investments are already in place or in planning in order to revitalize or develop that business corridor in order to ensure that it's thriving, that it, it's accessible in more than just bus um, buses, but the parking options that you would need? And then there are also residents in that area, um, right? So people need parking, they live there. Um, and then this is a community where you have a lot of people that their lifestyles does not fit the lifestyles of the people that are advocating to remove parking. And so, yes, and what I mean by that is that people of lower socioeconomic class then have a grandmother that's sickly that they have to get to, a child that they have to drop off. They have to rush from school to get to work or from work to get to school. This, I'm talking about single parents that are older. Um, and if that doesn't you know, relate to you in any kind of way. Um, I, I, for example, was 23, um, no green card. I had to pay for college on my own. I lived in a shelter. I had a child. And I had a, a sick uh, mom to get to. So these categories are very normal for anybody in, in, in these communities, D7 or D4. And so you need a car. You need a hoopty. I had one. And so where do you park? How do I get to my kid? How do I pick up? How do I go to work? How do I go to school? I'm paying for school out of pocket. Remember, I'm not American. Like There's all of this, the immigrant population, all of these different nuances that I think in a conversation, especially in the community engagement, it's so fast, um, or it feels fast because it's two hours or two hours and a half. And people, the majority of the attendees are in the meeting are city employees or people that are not even from the area who are advocating for the thing. So then people have asked to take an inventory of who is attending these meetings. And I have. I've looked at it and I go, 
one, two, three, and I'll count and I'll say, wow, about 40 people that are either developers, engineers, people from the city, advocates that are outside of the community, and then about a good dozen people from the community. And the regulars, we all know them. We can name them <laughs> first name um, basis. Um, and so I know that there are some community efforts or community engagement efforts to reach to the businesses, to the residents, and I've asked for specifically data showing um, surveys to look at how people are standing on this. If it is community led, and I'm all full bikes, because you know what happened when I couldn't drive anymore? And they was like, hey, you're not supposed to have a license, and they took it. I bought a bike and a trailer, and I put my kid in it, <laughs> and I take them to school. Um, and so I'm all for bikes. It's not for everybody, right? Your life changes, you have flexibility, you can work from home, or you have more money, and you can just do that. Um, or you have a good job, you can get in at a certain time. There's a balance that needs to be created, and the community engagement process for Blue Hill Master Plan, uh, at least the feedback that I'm getting, is that there needs to be more intentional outreach in a way that reaches more people, the people on the ground, the people with less access not just the regular Joes that show up from civic associations. Um, and they're the ones saying that too, right? So I, you know, and I, the meeting with the mayor, it can't be a delivery of what's gonna happen. Like, if you guys have already decided and this is what the community wants to know, that it's really community-led and that you're listening and that it's going to be about what the community wants. But if you've decided that this is the best thing for the community, and you have best practices or science that says this is the best for you, um, then allow the community to tell you, to show you why the transition is necessary before we can get to that. Yeah. Um, I don't see Boston creating, and maybe this is an idea, but we don't have transition to electric bikes, free bikes for parents of low socioeconomic class that has room for your child on it, and we'll give it to you with helmets and all safety gear. There's no such thing. We're not doing that. So we can't force or push people to electric bike or electric cars or anything like that. I want, um, I want to see real transparent community engagement processes. Um, and I know that your department in, specific, in particularly is trying to do that, but it almost feels like we're not reaching people. Not necessarily your fault, but what have we thought about this, and what can we do to actually reach more people? Um, so those are all great points, and I, I guess I, I just want to start by saying um, a couple of things. One is, and I'm going to ask Vinit to talk a little bit about the engagement process that we've been uh, a part of, but first, nobody is advocating for removing parking, right? We understand the role that this street plays in the business community and people's movement and people live on Blue Hill Lab. This is a complicated space that needs to do a lot of things for a lot of different people and many of those people drive. Many of those people need to drive. The goal is not to remove parking, to change how people choose to travel. But when we look at the street today, there are more than 10,000 people a day traveling on that street in a bus and they are losing hours out of their week stuck in traffic. They are, this is, a, this is an injustice for people who travel that we have not dedicated any space to them. The people who travel on the bus, that we have not given them the space to allow them to move efficiently on a street. And we have an opportunity to address that. And that is, that is the genesis of this project. And that is why we are so focused on doing this work. But we know when we do that, that any change has other consequences or other impacts. And so we have to be hearing from as many of the different stakeholders in the street as we can and reflecting all of their needs in there. I think, you know, you, you sort of made a comment of like the majority of people are opposed to this. I don't think, you know, to my knowledge, nobody... The majority of people that contact me. Yes, right, and I think this is... This is I have people that support it. 100%, and, and you, you hit the nail on the head of, of the challenge when you talked about the community meetings, right? Because we, we are doing regular monthly meetings, and as you noted, they are very sparsely attended. Um, many of the people who attend are regular meeting attendees, which is great, and we welcome their input and value their input. 
but so often those kinds of meetings become seen as a proxy for the community when there are thousands or tens of thousands of people who either don't know, don't attend, can't attend because they're working or they're caring for their kids or they're stuck trying to get home uh, from work. Right? So we have to be very, very intentional and deliberate about how we reach more people and how we meet people where they are. And I, Vineet, I would invite you to talk just briefly about like, sure. some of the ways we've structured the engagement on this project. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, as, as you point out, Councillor, it, it's a challenge to try and reach uh, with an intentional approach to people who are not able to attend a regular community meeting in the evening. And so what we've what we've started, what we have done from the outset is that we have contacted local community groups, local people who live there, and they have made them part of the team that is helping us figure out how to do this intentional outreach. And so we've, you, we've asked them to give us guidance on how best to reach to the kind of uh, bus riders or people who live there who have to drive of how we can get in touch with them. So we are making some progress in that direction. The other piece is that, as the chief pointed out, that the beneficiaries of the bus lanes are people who live in the neighborhood because all the bus routes on Blue Hill Avenue start in Maripan and then go up to the Roxbury area and, so, and then branch out to, to other parts of the city. And so we are doing surveys on, with bus riders to understand what their needs actually are. We are also working with uh, our small business department, our main streets departments to kind of do uh, outreach to small businesses along the entire corridor. Uh, we are working with our mayor's office of housing uh, to make sure that uh, uh, displacement and affordability are part of the discussion on the transportation improvements that are being done on Blueville, or will be done on Blueville Avenue. So we're trying to reach out through different avenues as much as we can to the full spectrum of the community that lives in the area. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Christy? Kirsty. Kirsty. Yeah, Kirsty. Kirsty. Yeah. She's awesome. And she broke all of this down to me. And I was like, what an amazing idea. Um, but I would think that's something that would take so much money, like a capital investment like this, that you would do some sort of like digital campaign. Um, people are on Facebook, people are, you know what I mean? And right. there would be like a little video, a little Blue Hill Ave Master Plan for Dummies kind of cartoon thing telling people, hey, you get on, this is what a middle lane is, and this is why it's good for the environment, we get to breathe more, or something like that. Um, but we don't have time for that anymore. <laughs> but for the future, Absolutely. I would imagine, yeah. you know, like a little video that circulates. Yeah, and we, we've we also made a huge effort to talk with younger people in the neighborhoods. And so, you know, we've been holding events, which are kind of fun events, uh, to talk about some of these issues and really uh, kind of engage uh, youth in the community to, to understand what the issues are and hear from them. Here's the thing, like, when you talk about environmental issues, that it's not that people don't agree, it's that we have to do a better job at making sure that people have the information and understand it in a way yeah. that's digestible, yeah, exactly. that's user friendly. Yeah. Um, and so I suggest creative ideas like that in, sort, in terms of you know, um, breaking it down for the environment, the, the science behind it, right? And the why, um, and then reaching people where they are, meeting them where they are. And, I think that the hard conversation is talking about Mattapan, Roxbury, Grove Hall, right? And then you have Lower Mills over there, Hyde Park, um, what is it, Milton? And then you have Cummings or Rosendale, all around it. So people are trying to get to Blue Hill from those affluent communities. And so the hard conversation is that Blue Hill Avenue, historically disenfranchised, and now you're like, well, okay, well now I want to invest in it. I want to, we want to fix it. We want to, we, I'm here now, I wasn't here yesterday, I'm here now and I want to fix it. So the, the hard conversation is, this is a community that historically has been disenfranchised, so if you want to change it, if you want to move my cheese, you gotta at least tell me what flavor, I gotta be a part of fixing it and figuring it out. And so 
that conversation is always becomes racial, as we know it, because systemically there's all of these other issues. And so I'm just suggesting um, to get a little bit more investment, more money in those creative, like sure. digital stuff that educates people on the environment stuff. Okay. Um, because it's a hard conversation. Yeah. They'll say, well, you're putting, you're putting buses over people's lives. What about black lives? Are you, are you, investing, in, are you investing in capital, in, in, in um, closing the wealth gap? Because black men die more than they do of environment. And so, you see what I mean? Yeah. Then when we get into that hard space, it's like, oh my gosh, wait, where do we start? Well, we gotta start with education and working together to bring people there. There's not enough time, because you have a job to do and a deadline. But um, hopefully, again, if I can be of help in terms of engaging my district, my constituents, um, mediating or mitigating any conversations that brings us and makes it productive, then brings us to results, then I'm, I'm happy to offer that. Thank you. Um, I can submit my questions in writing to you. Um, why do you have all night? You want to stay here with me? Um, I have a lot of questions. It's, it's all about parking. It's all about, um, I really think we should put lines on the streets. I really do for parking. Um, the spaces are just so, and, and it's true. My constituents call me, I get to Mount Pleasant, and I drive over there, and I'm like, she's not even here. And Lavette, if you're watching, yeah, I'm talking about you. And so I'm like, she's not even here. So I drive all the way down there, and I see exactly what she means. There's like all these big spaces in between cars. I'm like, that would drive me nuts. It's quality of life. I want to park. I'm tired. I got home. I want to park. And I know that everybody's going through this. Um, so I don't know. I'm going to look, I'm going to look a little bit into that and I'll keep, I'm, we'll talk some more about that. I'm happy to talk more about lines. <laughs> Nobody wants to take money out of your department. So I don't think I have any questions about, um, where monies can come out of. I don't think your budget is inflated. Um, as far as Hokies, $16 an hour, y'all can't even compete with Grubhub. Like, <laughs> you're not gonna be able to hire anybody. So um, collective bargaining or not, uh, promotions or not, um, these teenagers making paid, getting paid more, right? They're, they're doing Uber Eats, they're doing all this other stuff. So, um, I'll be looking into that. If I find money anywhere, um, I always said that the mayor is mama bear and she got money under her pillows and she thinks I don't know. So I'm, if, I, if we find money anywhere where we can move, I think it's raising it. I don't think it's, you need 20 Hokies. Okay, maybe it's, maybe it's not. And if it's collective bargaining issue, um, we need to do better. I don't, I don't see how anybody can live on $16 an hour. And you guys always hear me talking about everybody getting a raise. You get a raise, you get a raise. Everybody should get a raise. But seriously though, it is Boston. How can we appreciate people unless we're respecting people to be able to take care of their families? Um, I do have so much, much more, um, but I will email to you, Chief, and please submit your responses. Um, as soon if as you can, can CC IGR on that as well, sir, I think coordinating all the things that we need to get back on. So yeah, make but, them answer it. No. Please, please, please send. No, we'll, we'll answer it. <laughs> we just don't want it to get lost, so um, please, please send. Absolutely. Um, did you have any closing remarks before I adjourn? Uh, only to say that I appreciate uh, the work of you and your colleagues here in this process, and um, we are uh, grateful for all the support that you continuously show our team and uh, both in uh, providing the financial resources that we need, but also working with us to uh, help us do better to deliver for the people of Boston. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, amazing, amazing, amazing work. Um, and I'll still ask for more. I'll still ask for those lines on the parking spaces. Um, thank you uh, so very much and look forward to working with you. Meeting adjourned.